Dr. So here is my very good friend, my very old friend. We met many decades ago. I won't, I won't tell you how many decades ago that was. Uh, and we, we did some nice work together at the Brompton in London. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to be back in Seoul um, to participate in this symposium. Um, my brief for today, uh, for this morning anyway, is on what? Anatomy of the ventricular conduction system. Can I talk about the atrioventricular node or not? Yes, I can. All right, thank you. You know, I have to always ask his permission. He's the boss here, okay? So I have to, to be respectful to the boss. Fine. So we start off with a normal heart. Uh, do we have a nice normal heart? Uh, one that's inlet, outlet open. Ah, perfect. Thank you. We might have another one. <laughs> I'm very fussy here. Ah. Oh, this one. Good. Okay. Let's go. We've got now here, is the chair, is my chair too low or is the screen too far in front? Okay, we've got the right atrium, the right ventricle sitting in front, so we're more or less anatomical location, uh, anterior posterior kind of view, uh, not a great deal of fat in this heart. We've got the pulmonary trunk here, the right atrial appendage, and we see straight into the right ventricle. Can we just zoom in? I, I think you don't need to move the camera apart from zooming in and out. Thank you. So now we can see the tricuspid valve apparatus, the anterior leaflet, anterior superior leaflet, the septal leaflet, and the, the uh, inferior or the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. We don't see a great deal up here because the, the anterior leaflet has folded over in this direction. But we see some cordy tendini attaching to this tiny little peppery muscle, which is the medial peppery muscle or the muscle of Lanchisi or also known as the conal peppery muscle. And it is, this muscle is sitting on the trabecular septal marginalis or septal marginal trabeculation, which is not very, very well delineated in this heart. But Dr. Igawa showed you a similar structure just now on another heart specimen, uh, which actually showed the moderator band coming out of it. But this, in this heart, the moderator band has been chopped off here. It should be coming off about here and going across to the free wall, attaching to the free wall here. And along the way, we see the anterior group of peppery muscles. So there was the cut here, a cut there, and that moderator band has been um, separated. But if we look up here then, as we learned yesterday, we can see the commissure between this, the superior leaflet and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. We can, if we can persuade the heart to open up a little bit here and we zoom in more closely, we can see the commissure of the tricuspid valve is actually in this region here, okay? This is where you find the fan-shaped cordy for that commissure. So over here is not actually the commissure. We are still on the septal leaflet, at least for, for um, people like me who are more anatomists than than the clinical cardiologist, this part is not truly the commissure. But have you noticed already that we're missing a little bit of the tricuspid valve leaflet tissue here? And this is a normal heart. It varies very much from heart to heart, but in this particular case, we are missing a little bit of the tricuspid valve tissue here because we can already see the membranous septum, can't we? This little structure here more white in, in coloration than compared to the more brownish kind of um, tissue that we saw just now. Too intense, Dr. So, 
move back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, with more, more in this sort of size, all right? So over here, we have the septal leaf, the tricuspid valve, and its attachment, its, its uh, so-called fibrous attachment. Actually, the tricuspid valve annulus is not so fi fibrotic, but we have a division of this membranous septum into a component which is interventricular in position and another component up here which is atrioventricular in uh, position. But if we move back towards the atrial chamber from behind here, just move up a little bit, here we have the apical portion of the triangle cock area. Coronary sinus is here, okay? marking the inferior border of a triangle cock. So we have the anterior border where the, the septal leaflet of tricuspid valve inserts, and the posterior border, the tendon of todaro area, inferior border, part of it marked by the orifice of the coronary sinus. So we are talking about the apical part of this triangle of cock containing the compact atrioventricular node and what is feeding into the compact atrioventricular node is the, comp is the transitional cell zone um, that receives inputs su from superiorly from the, the, limb the anterior limbus area of the fossa ovale, from leftward, and also from right side, the, the right atrial myocardial aspect, feeding into the compact nodal area. And I'll show you this on a diagram shortly. But whilst on the specimen from the atrioventricular nodal area, uh, the atrioventricular conduction bundle comes forwards into this very fibrotic region, which is termed the central fibrous body. And from there, it penetrates through to the ventricular uh, structures um, as the penetrating bundle of His. And then it follows this pathway sandwiched between the membrane septum and the top of the muscular ventricular septum to give the atrioventricular conduction bundle. It carries on forwards. We are looking at the right uh, ventricular aspect of the septum. So we can't see the bundle without um, uh, deep dissection because the atrioventricular conduction bundle veers to the left side of the ventricular septum, not on the right side. But if you follow the track of the atrioventricular conduction bundle, you will come up here where you will find the right bundle branch emerging to be very superficial in the subendocardium. So the landmark of the emergence of that right bundle branch is this little peppery muscle. And what did I say it was called? There are like three different names for it, okay? The muscle of Lanchisi, the medial peppery muscle, the conal peppery muscle, okay? So this is, for the cardiac surgeons anyway, they know this structure very, very well because the right bundle branch will emerge just here, comes down as a very thin, hair-like strand of, of uh, tissue, which is the fi fibrotic uh, sheath encasing the right bundle branch conduction cells running down the trabecular septum marginalis. And then, remember this part where I said the moderated band has been uh, divided? Yeah? When it comes down here, it then branches lots and lots and lots to into the ventricular septum towards the left ventricle as well as coming back into the right ventricle towards the apical part of the ventricle. And interesting enough, one of the major fascicles travels through the moderator band, which I've got between the tips of forceps now, travels through the moderator band across to this side, yeah? to this side where it's been cut across to send further branches of the Purkinje fiber network to the parietal wall of the right ventricle. If I close the heart back together, 
On the outside, you will see that this is the parietal wall, and this is the anterior descending coronary artery. So this is the interventricular septum. So this is the right ventricular parietal wall. Yeah. So flip that back. You notice where the moderated band attaches to the parietal wall. All right, you have this picture in your mind. From there, the his Purkinje fiber network will ramify extensively going towards the apex, apical part of the heart, as well as up towards the subpulmonary infundibulum. Okay? So this is the right ventricular aspect of the uh, ventricular conduction system. Now, what about the left side? Okay. You know, we always imagine or talk of the atrioventricular node, and we use a triangle of cock as the landmark. Triangle of cock is the right atrial landmark. All right? That gives us the impression that the atrioventricular node is the right-sided structure. Well, it is in a way, but it is actually an interatrial structure, all right? It's sitting at the bottom of the interatrial septum. But yes, it is more of a right-sided structure in the sense that the, it, when I show you the, the, pic, the diagram shortly, in the sense that it is leaning more to the right side, but it has both right atrial extension as well as left atrial extensions, okay? But the, from the atrioventricular node, we have the AV conduction bundle. But look at the left side of the ventricular septum, okay? Mitral valve, this is the area of fibrous continuity between aortic and mitral valves. By fibrous continuity, mean, we mean that there is no muscle separating these two left heart valves. Can you see muscle here? None, isn't it? It's white, what, it's what the surgeons call white tissue, right? But if you are a vet, if there are any vets sitting in the audience, they will disagree because vets will find some muscle in equine specimens, right? Like horses, for example. So don't get too carried away. In human situation, it's exceedingly rare to find muscle in this region, which also explains why you are less likely to have accessory AV pathways in this region because you don't have muscle. The aortic outflow tract sits between the mitral annulus and the ventricular septum. So you're very un highly unlikely to have accessory pathway is sitting in this part of the mitral annulus, okay? Now look at the outflow tract. You see the white tissue here. This we already said is the region of aortic mitral fibrous continuity. And the surgeons recognize the right and the left fibrous trigons, meaning they are, th they are slightly bigger uh, parts of fibrous tissue sitting on the extreme ends of this region of fibrous continuity. So the left fibrous trigon is here. The right fibrous trigon is here, nearer to the septum. In fact, on the septum. And what is adjoining the right fibrous trigon? Have we got the torch? Yeah. See that? Membrane septum. Okay? So the membrane septum together with the right fibrous trigon forms the central fibrous body, right? So the membrane septum is a thinner part of the cardiac septum. Now, so the central fibrous body being here, the penetrating bundle of his will appear here. And the continuation of that is the common atrioventricular conduction bundle sandwiched between the membrane septum and the top 
of the muscular ventricular septum. So your landmark for this region where the membranous septum is, is that aortic commissure between the non-coronary aortic leaflet and the right coronary aortic leaflet. See, that's the right coronary orifice. Okay, So it is this commissure area, just underneath it is the membranous septum. And here is the central fibrous body where the atrioventricular conduction bundle will come through, which is why it's very important to respect this region if you are doing implantations of aortic valves, right? Transcatheter implantations, the TAVIs, the valve sitting here, if you're just a little bit low, the valve might be impinging on the area of the atrioventricular conduction bundle. Down here then, you will find very superficially in the subendocardial surface, the left bundle branch, okay? The left bundle branch actually branches into three main fascicles. Clinically, you talk about left anterior and left posterior fascicles, but anatomically, there are usually three fascicles. There's an anterior fascicle, there is a posterior fascicle, and there is a middle fascicle. But not to worry, all these three fascicles are interconnected also. They're not isolated from each other, okay? And the Purkinje fiber network will extend further down the ventricles, and they can cross the cavity of the ventricles via little strands like these, which are called false tendons, okay? Echocardiographers call these telegraphic wires. Some of these false tendons will carry the Purkinje fiber network across to the papillary muscle supporting the mitral valve, and also, of course, across to the, the free walls of the left ventricle, and down also to the apex, and back up all the way towards the subaortic outflow area. So any questions so far on the specimen? Are you happy so far? Yes or no? No. <laughs> the relation to the papillary muscle. Look at the papillary muscles. They've, they've gone over here. Yeah. So this, this ventricle has, in, has been opened in inlet outflow tract view. So two groups of papillary muscles here with anterolateral posterior medial uh, positions, okay? In this specimen, he says, All right, thank you. This Dr. So has cut in this specimen, longitudinally down the inflow tract in between the papillary muscles and open up the left ventricle. And he's also cut into the anterior leaflet of the aortic valve, right? So he's, he's made this cut through the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to show you the outflow to the aorta. So we've got the anterolateral and posterior medial groups of papillary muscles. You can note these very fine apical trabeculations and lots of telegraphic wires as well, okay? If we look inside here, I might just persuade you to see some whitish coloration on the septal surface. Can you see that? Some whitish areas? Yeah? The whitish areas represent the fibrous tissue sheath surrounding the upper portions of the left bundle branch. Yes, that's much more photogenic now. Okay? Very good cameraman here. <laughs> so we've got nicely de demonstrating here the upper part of the left bundle branch. All right? So believe me, it's very superficial, just in the subendocardium. So let me try and show you some um, diagrams now. Okay, atrioventricular 
Thank you. Dr. So is so helpful. I'm really spoiled. Okay. Got the right atrium. We've got compact atrioventricular node. Okay. We have the leftward prong or inferior extension of the compact node and rightward prong or rightward extension of the compact atrioventricular node. And these were thought to be involved in the slow pathway in AVNRT, all right? But I have not put in the transitional cell zone. In the next picture, or in, yeah, in the next picture, I have the transitional cell zone put in. But this is just to show you the membrane septum from the right side, tricuspid valve insertion, crossing the membrane septum, right? On the left side here, commissure between the right coronary and non-coronary aortic valve leaflets, membrane septum, central fibrous body coming out, the his bundle, atrioventricular conduction bundle, then the fascicles of the left bundle branch. All right? Next picture. Can we? Thank you. Here I'm try trying to show you the correlation with the histologic pictures. Let's ignore this, pan uh, this uh, column first, right? The diagram shows you the relationship between the membrane septum and the atrioventricular conduction bundle. This green area here marks for you the central fibrous body. And I've drawn in the compact atrioventricular node with its inferior extensions. And these are my representation of the transitional cell zone, okay? Feeding in from superior root, from the leftward root, from the inferior root. The transitional cells sit between ordinary atrial myocardium and the compact atrioventricular node. In this histologic picture, we can see the compact atrioventricular node as sort of tighter arranged, very small myocytes. Myocytes stained out in red, by the way, fibrous tissue in green. So very tightly clustered myocytes, smaller uh, cells. Uh, these uh, represent, these are the regions of the compact atrioventricular node. The nodal artery, the little artery supplying the atrioventricular node, right? Some people use this um, when they, they fill it with, with dye to tell them the apical, the, the, to give them the location of the triangle of cock. And this cutting cross section is the tendon of Todaro represented on this diagram here, this structure. So this is the right atrial endocardial surface. Immediately underneath it, we see the usual atrial myocardium, but between the ordinary working atrial myocardium and the compact nodal cells, you see these little strands also magnified here, these elongated cells. These are the transitional cells feeding in toward the compact nodal cells, right? So over here we have in green the left atrial endocardial surface. So we have the left, um, the atrial septum here with ordinary working atrial myocardium, but we still have the compact node sitting um, towards the left side of the atrial septum, extending all the way towards the right side of the atrial septum. Note the difference in levels of attachments of the valves. We can just about see the attachment of the tricuspid valve here, tricuspid annulus, and the attachment of the mitral valve, mitral annulus here, okay? So the mitral annulus is attached at a higher level compared to the tricuspid annulus. And this is the fibro fatty tissue plane separating atrial tissues from ventricular tissues. So in fact, this is the very tip or the apical part of the inferior pyramidal space. So if we were to take a cut more towards here, instead of towards here, we take a 
more deeper here, we are actually exiting the heart. There you will find epicardial fat tissue in this region. It's part of the, the uh, pyramidal space um, in, uh, that separates uh, right and left atria as well as lying on top of the ventricular mass. So this part is the top of the muscular ventricular septum, right? We take a section further up here. We are through the central fibrous body, through the His bundle, and through the tricuspid annulus. And this is where we are. This structure here is where the tendon of Todaro is inserting into this big blob of fibrous tissue, which is the central fibrous body, isn't it? And look at this uh, circular structure, which is colored red. This is the His bundle cut in cross section, completely surrounded by green, which is a fibrous tissue sheath of the central fibrous body. So this is the, the His bundle is the only muscular continuity between atrial myocardium and subsequently the ventricular myocardium. So there's no other possibility, possibility of atrial myocardium connecting with ventricular myocardium unless you are looking at a heart with accessory atrioventricular pathways, right? So the only muscular continuity is through the His bundle. We use the same, we use the same diagram here, but this time we have two slices here. One is taken just at this level, just at the beginning part of the membranous septum, all right? So atrial, myocardium, but green, right? Because we are near the end of the central, near the end of the central fibrous body, we're heading towards the membranous septum, but we see it surrounded by green. This is now the common atrioventricular conduction bundle. We are already on top of the muscular ventricular septum. See the annulus of the tricuspid valve? Yeah? So functionally, this part of the cardiac septum is in atrioventricular position, but it is part and parcel of the ventricular myocardium. All right? No separation in this ventricular septum. Here is the left ventricle. This is the endocardial surface of the left ventricle. This are the panel of, on histology. It's taken right where I've cut into this diagram, right? So we're right into the aortic root. This corresponds to part of the aortic valve. So we're in the sinus here, right? And this is the membranous septum. We're here. This is the tricuspid valve annulus or attachment. We are here, right? You see that? I've helped you to delineate the branching atrioventricular conduction bundle. And you see what I mean when I said to you right on the, at the beginning when I showed you the heart specimen, I say the atrioventricular conduction bundle heads towards the left side of the septum. Here we are, on the left side of the ventricular septum, isn't it? This is the endocardium of the left ventricle. Here we have the common atrioventricular conduction bundle, but actually it's already branching. We've got the left bundle branch right in the subendocardium, and we've got the right bundle branch, see? It is still ensheathed in green, fibrous tissue. Yeah, so it's not pre-exciting ventricular myocardium mouse size yet. It's still heading away from 
the atrioventricular node. We are still carrying the impulse, but not uh, distributed to working ventricular myocardium at this stage, still surrounded by green, by fibrous tissue. You see the bulk of the ventricular septum. It is piercing through ventricular septum, and it will emerge here in the subendocardium. The landmark for that emergence, if you haven't fallen asleep, don't remember anymore. Where would it come out superficially in the endocardium on the right side of the ventricular septum? That little peppery muscle, yeah? The base of that tiny little peppery muscle. So when you're driving your catheters through, you suddenly get a right bundle branch when you're touching that part of the septum, right? Okay, your his bundle catheter should be here, right? You're not convinced, i show you another histologic picture now, okay? The membranous septum, the left side of the ventricular septum, the bifurcating bundle. Left bundle branch in the subendocardium, you see it there? The right bundle branch piercing through the myocardium. You see it there? Oopsie. Not quite reaching the subendocardium, okay? So it's trying to get out to the subendocardium, but here it is still insulated by fibrous tissue. All right, no activation yet. <coughs> How about this? I can't show you as an equivalent picture on human heart, so I've used a sheep and a cow, yeah? In this experiment, I can trace the Purkinje fiber network, the distribution of the right bundle branch into the Purkinje fiber network in calves and in sheep. I have the right ventricle open up. The moderator band varies in animals. In the sheep, it's a little bit thicker. In the calf, it, it sometimes can be thicker, but most of the time, it's very thin, right? But do you see, even when it's so thin, do you see this strand, the black coloration, marking the right bundle, one of the right bundle branch fascicles, crossing to the parietal wall and branching incredibly in a complex network all the way all over the endocardial surface as well as penetrating into the thickness of the ventricular wall and into the thickness of the ventricular septum, right? Similarly, in the sheep or heart, you see this little black line? That's one of the major fascicles. And my advice to the cardiac surgeons is always, do not be tempted in a, in a, a heart with right ventricular hypertrophy for example, fellow cetrology, I said, do not be tempted to divide the moderator band because you are going to be sacrificing one of the major branches of the right bundle branch, okay? This is a, a picture again of the calf heart in more uh, highlighted, but more close up view of this fascinating intricate Purkinje fiber network, okay? Now you see the, the line more clearly. In the left ventricle, I've shown you on a specimen false tendons here, crisscrossing the cavity, and this is a human heart. The last picture, how about that? In a sheep, Purkinje fiber network, the left bundle branch. You note in the sheep, in animal hearts, the left bundle branch dis, um, uh, appearance is slightly different from that of the human situation. 
there seems to be a longer, common left bundle branch descending further down the septum before it then begins to branch and divide. But note the fascicles, the distal parts of the fascicles crossing the cavity to the papillary muscles to provide the, to continue in the Purkinje fiber network, utilizing these false tendons, isn't it? Yeah. So again, better not to, to try and damage or, or sacrifice these false tendons, I think. Probably in the human situation, not all of them will be carrying these branches, but some of them will do, right? And look at them, look at the ones particularly supplying the peppery muscles. All right? So I think that completes for me, anyway, the ventricular conduction system. Any questions? I'm happy to take some questions at this stage before we move on to the next part. Yes? Thank you. Thank you for very, very nice uh, so presentation and uh, showing us a very good specimen. And uh, uh, for us, uh, left bundle branch block, so we, we see, so we in, in clinical situation, we see so the left bundle branch block patient. In left bundle branch block patient, do you think, do you think what, where do you think is the, the block site? <laughs> the left, in terms of left bundle branch block, um, if you're talking about the total blockage of the whole left bundle branch, then I would expect the blockage site to be near to the upper part where the main fascicle is, okay? Um, otherwise, you may have blockage of part of the left bundle branch and not the entire left bundle branch. If we go to the... <coughs> or maybe I misunderstood your question. No, no, no. Uh, sometimes we see a uh, complete uh, complete left bundle branch block or incomplete left bundle branch block. So can you, can you, can you explain uh, the, the, the about the, the, the where? Where the, the block site is, uh, is the, the blo where is the block site of incomplete AB, com the LBBB and the, 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 the block site of complete LBBB? Okay. If you Look at this picture. Can we zoom in on this side? Enlarge this side. Perfect. Okay. This is the atrioventricular conduction bundle, the common atrioventricular conduction bundle. And this is the top of the left bundle branch. Yeah? These are the fascicles. This is, this is my attempt to represent the anterior fascicle, the middle fascicle, and the posterior fascicle. If you have complete left bundle branch block, you are talking of a blockage up here, high up. Yeah. If you are talking about incomplete or partial left bundle branch block, you are talking of blockage maybe lower down here, or maybe over here, or maybe over here. So you are more distally situated. Does that correlate in your mind? Because uh, there is a two, two, two branches, anterior fascicle and yes. posterior fascicle. Clinically, so, you yeah, talk clinical, of two, yeah. yes. And uh, so, actually, it's the anterior fascicular block and the uh, posterior fascicular block is uh, different from uh, incomplete AV block, incomplete uh, the left bundle the branch block. So you're saying anterior block and posterior block is different from complete AV block? Incomplete AV block. Incomplete AV yeah. block. Do you have an explanation, Dr. So? I don't have an explanation for that difference. No. Lao from Hong Kong. I, I want to follow up with Dr. O's uh, question. In uh, people with dilated cardiomyopathy, they have left bundle branch block, and some of them uh, would uh, benefit from cardiac resynchronization therapy, whereas the same left bundle branch block may not. In the literature, there are suggestions of some, what is known as a classical left bundle branch block, 
with, with left axis deviation and a variety of minor changes, whereas there are also non-classical left bundle branch block. Do you have a anatomical <laughs> differences between these two types of left bundle branch block? I'm afraid we, don't, we haven't in done investigations of that sort. Uh, and other question is, of course, is currently of interest would be the use of his bundle pacing uh, to normalize a bundle branch box situations. Where anatomically do you think is the best approach and how deep and how, how, how to do that? How to do it? I, I, I can't tell you how to do it. You are the guys doing it. Yeah? You are the experts. But I can just show you on this picture here. The his bundle is more on the right, it begins with being more on the right side of the heart. But then it's going to shift towards the right, the left side when you go more distally. Okay? But you have this fibrous tissue that is surrounding the his bundle. So if you're trying to pace at the his bundle, I think initially you would want to be within the right when it's at the beginning on the right, towards the right side heart structures than when it's more deeper into the left heart structures. Okay. I, I'm very sorry to bothering you again. No and, uh, worries. So, yes, uh, I'm learning all the time. Yes, and uh, actually I, I'm clinician, clinical clinician, clinic, sorry, clinically physician, so, so when I meet so, AB and RT, a, a, a nodal reentry tachycardia. So, so I have a lot of interest in the, the, the location of slow pathway. Actually, the slow pathway is uh, the target of the uh, ABNRT. So, but some tachycardia is uh, the typical the ABNRT, but it's uh, some, 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 some kind of the, the ABNRT is uh, atypical ABNRT. Then usually, sh actually, the location of the slow pathway is uh, Different, and uh, sometimes in the coronary sinus or sometimes in the left side, uh, the slow pathway. Do you have some more? Sorry, I, 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 if 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 it is not uh, so if if not if not uh, root, so okay. Would you mind? Would you mind this, uh, the location of the, the slow pathway? Okay, if we take this diagram, okay, your, the slow pathway is said to be targeted in this region. So it's the region that's towards the apex of the triangle cock, right? And this is your septal isthmus where you would target to ablate your typical slow pathway. But we were at a session yesterday, we discussed the slow pathway and I had to give a presentation on the complex anatomy of the slow pathway. And I had to think very deeply, how am I supposed to approach this? But actually, if you l l think of the slow pathway region as being sitting here, what are the tissues you're dealing with? You're dealing with atrial myocardium. You're dealing with compact nodal cells, which are the inferior extensions. Yeah? In fact, Ton Becker and, and uh, colleagues and Saito, I think Dr. Saito, uh, described the implication of the inferior nodal extensions being the substrate for the slow pathway. So we've got already two different kinds of tissues. But look, you've also got a whole zone of transitional cells that are feeding into the compact atrioventricular node. So I think the slow pathway involvement that you're talking about for your slow, for your atypical types coming from the left or from the coronary sinus would involve the transitional cell zones coming from the left side and coming from the, the uh, coming from the left side and coming from the inferior side 
the inferior sides are very closely related to the wall, the muscular wall of the coronary sinus, right? So I think it involves the muscular continuity between the coronary sinus wall as well as the transitional cell zones for your atypical. I have yet to be proven, obviously. <laughs> we need some people who would do experimental studies on this. Thank you very much. I'm from China. Uh, you know, the AV block have uh, the first and the second degree and the third degree. In the third, in the second degree, AV block include the top one and the top two. In top one, the PR interval is the progressive uh, progression. So my question is, uh, when the second degree AV block uh, top one happened? What's wrong with the uh, conduction system? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, but I, I'm not sure that I'm the appropriate person to answer that question. I'm sure Dr. Igawa will have some comments to say. For me, anatomically speaking, there is complete heart block and there's partial heart block, okay? So anato the anatomic substrate for complete heart block is a total disruption of the atrioventricular conduction bundle. Anatomically, for the partial heart block, it is a partial destruction of the AV conduction bundle, usually by infiltration of unwanted tissue like fibrotic changes, for example, yeah? Thank you very much. Any comments, Dr. Igawa? No? <laughs> All right. Are we ready to move to the next stage? Can I ask you a question? How many of you do congenital heart malformations? Or wish to do congenital heart malformations? Because if none of you are doing it yet, I hope to stimulate one or two of you to take it up, okay? <laughs> because it's, it's a fascinating topic and I think quite a challenging topic to deal with if you're going to do EP in congenital heart malformations. Because not only do you need to understand um, the conduction system in congenital heart malformations in the native situation, but you also need to understand the changes that are made post-operatively with, with, with interventions into the heart, yeah? where the surgeons put the patch, how the patch will interrupt the, the isthmuses that you want to interrupt or ablate. Okay? So let me move to the computer, and I'm going to, to show you a short presentation first. Can, can I use the computer? Right. Korean. <laughs> What's that? Ah. Okay, good. So I've, I've changed the title a little bit, what the EP needs to know. I'm just going to talk briefly about atrioventricular septal defects, Epstein malformation, transposition of the great arteries, and tetralogy of fallow, okay? So to begin with, 
an atrioventricular septal defect. Just two pictures to give you an illustration of what it looks like pre-op and post-op, right? This is an example of a so-called canal kind of atrioventricular septal defect viewed from the right side of the heart. The right atrium, right ventricle. This is more or less your right lateral orientation, okay? The coronary sinus here, and in the middle of the heart, a great big hole. And this hole is the atrioventricular septal defect. It's called atrioventricular septal defect because it usually would have both and would have communications both at the atrial level as well as at the ventricular level. Well, the important thing to note that in a heart with a hole in the middle of the heart, where is the triangle of cock? Where would your central fibrous body be? That will give you your His bundle. So the whole land, all your landmarks for finding the triangle of cock, finding the, the central fibrous body, all that's gone, isn't it? Puff. You've got a hole in the middle of the heart, right? you still got a coronary sinus, so you're going to say, okay, that's the inferior border of the triangle of cock. Hey, but then, what about your annulus, your valve annulus? Well, it's somewhere here. This is the, the free margin of the atrial septum. This is the top of the ventricular septum. Here's your inferior vena cava orifice, so inferior cable vein orifice. And this is the remnant of your eustachian valve coming forward. So you can think that when you trace that forward, you have the tendon of Todaro. Okay, so you've got the tip of the triangle of cock here. You, think, you would be thinking, well, I'm going to have an atrioventricular node sitting here. But what use is it to have an atrioventricular node sitting here? Would it be useful? Not at all, because it's never going to reach the ventricular tissues, isn't it? There's a great big gap between this part of the heart and that part of the heart. So what's happened in hearts with atrioventricular septal defect is that the atrioventricular node is completely displaced very inferiorly, right? So your node is no longer in the region of the triangle of cock, but is more related to the area where the ventricular septum comes up to meet with the atrioventricular junction. All right, so you take that part as the landmark for the penetrating bundle of his, and you work backwards from there. That's the atrioventricular node. Still different from the normal, you have a very elongated, common atrioventricular conduction bundle. That bundle can be sitting, or usually would be sitting towards a little bit towards the left side of the septal crest. But occasionally, it sits right on top of the ventricular septal crest. So for the cardiac surgeons, we would recommend putting the patch, the sutures of the patch, more towards the right ventricular side of the septum, as we see here. This is a case with a repaired atrioventricular septal defect, where the surgeon has used two patches, an atrial patch and a ventricular patch, atrioventricular node is sitting back here, okay? Now, atrioventricular septal defects can commonly associated with Down syndrome, but can also be associated with other congenital malformations, like atrial isomerisms. And by atrial isomerisms, we mean that we have duplication of the atrial appendages, both on the right side and on the left side. So for example, if you talk about right isomerism, we mean that both atrial appendages are of right morphology. When we talk about left isomerism, we mean that both atrial appendages are of left morphology, so both of them are finger-like in shape. And in fact, Dr. So and I are possibly 
two of the few people in the whole world who have ever examined histologically the sinus node in this condition, in these two conditions, right? How many decades ago was that? So we looked at the sinus node in both right isomerism and left isomerism. So any guesses of the sinus node arrangement in right isomerism? You want to hazard a guess when you've got two right atrial appendages, two morphologically right atria? How many sinus nodes do you anticipate? Two sinus nodes, exactly. One on the right side, one on the left side. Now, what about left isomerism? One or zero, correct. He's an expert sitting there, yeah? When we do find one, it's usually hypoplastic. Sometimes we don't find any, okay? And when we do find one, it's usually not in the anticipated position. It's usually displaced posterior inferiorly. But then, remember we said we are two of the few people in the world who've ever looked histologically for the sinus node in, these, in isomerisms? Well, we also looked at very few examples, we have to admit. <laughs> we could not do more than 10 examples, I think. We were quite restricted. So for the younger people who want to practice histologic ex examinations of sinus nodes, I would encourage them to go ahead and give us more information on isomerisms, please. So isomerisms are, you would find quite a common association, atrioventricular septal defect. But then in isomerisms, you should also look out for slings. You may have two atrioventricular nodes and two atrioventricular conduction bundles joining up. All right, so for the advanced people, it's very important to know this situation particularly happens when the ventricles are in the unanticipated positions, in the wrong positions. For example, the left ventricle is sitting on the right side. Then think of atrioventricular conduction bundle slings. Okay? So this is just for interest for you. Left isomerism, AV block in about 15% of these uh, children. Yeah. The next malformation, Epstein. I think you would be seeing more of these cases in your practice than you would see isomerisms. So Epstein represents on this panel a normal heart where the tricuspid valve annulus is in the correct position. And Epstein, you still have that annulus but the valve leaflets are not free up to the end of this level. The valve leaflets are usually depressed down into the ventricular cavity. And this is quite an extreme form of Epstein in this particular case. Remember we talked about the different levels of mitral and tricuspid valves at the septal level. In Epstein, that difference in level is exaggerated, much, much more. This is a case of Epstein. It doesn't matter if it doesn't play, because I have Dr. Jung So has supplied me with a heart specimen. The leaflets that are affected is usually the part of the septal and part of the neural leaflet but important that the atrioventricular node and his bundle are in the regular locations. So it's sitting here at the apex of triangle cock. Sometimes people describe the triangle cock as being reduced in size. There is an association of some 20% of Epstein will present in your clinic with multiple accessory bypass tracks around the atrioventricular junction. It can be right-sided, can be left-sided accessory pathways. 
there's lack of vulva tissue, you are tackling these accessory pathways on the right side, the lack of vulva tissue, so less stable for the catheter to anchor to. It's also difficult to do a ventricular access to the ventricular insertions of the pathway because you just literally cannot get underneath the leaflets. If you've got an accessory pathway here, you cannot maneuver underneath the leaflets. And furthermore, Epstein's have been described to be associated with so-called atriofascicular conduction bundle, which is depicted in this diagram as having a nodal remnant or remnant of ring, specialized ring tissue, piercing the atrioventricular junction, a very long tract of conduction bundle, linking up distally with the right bundle branches. I must say I've never investigated histologically one of these examples. So I cannot say that this, um, I'm not aware of this being proven anatomically to have happened. The next malformation is complete transposition, also known as DTGA or TGA, okay? This is the situation. The great arteries are coming off from the wrong ventricles. And what happens usually in the old, old days? Nowadays in the modern era, where appropriate, the surgeons would simply, and I say simply, but it's quite a, a very difficult procedure, intricate procedure, to transect the great arteries and re-implant them in the correct positions and re-implant the coronary arteries. Okay, the, they would use the arterial switch procedure or so-called anatomical correction procedure. But in the, in the previous decades, the surgeons would have used something like this, which is called a mustard's procedure, utilizing an intra-atrial baffle. So what they do first is to take away the atrial septum, fashion this trouser-shaped baffle to redirect the flow from superior and inferior vena cava towards the left ventricle, towards the mitral orifice, into the left ventricle and then up the pulmonary trunk. Whereas the pulmonary venous flow would go over the baffle, appear behind the baffle, and over the trouser leg of the, the inferior and superior vena cava baffle and drain into the right ventricle. So there's a lot of incision lines in the atrial chambers post-procedure. And this is my diagram depicting one of these situations. I get take away the atrial septum, open up, so you look into the pulmonary vein orifices, you see the mitral orifice, you put a, a, a trouser-shaped baffle over here, so allow the pulmonary venous return to go through the tricuspid valve, and the cable return goes underneath the baffle to the mitral valve. So you reverse the flow situation to the mitral and tricuspid valve orifices. The right atrium becomes the new pulmonary venous atrium. The left atrium becomes the new systemic venous atrium. This still image shows you part of that baffle, the inferior vena cava baffle. And this is a posterior view of the front part of the heart, showing you the uh, pulmonary venous chamber, but this time going towards the right-sided atrium baffle to, um, into the right ventricle, okay? So what this picture also shows you is that in the right-sided atrium, you have to be aware, you have to check through the operation notes if your surgeon is very diligent to find where the coronary sinus ostium is. Is it left on now the new pulmonary venous atrium? Is it still left? on the right side of the atrial, or, or has, it, has the surgeon put the baffle over the coronary sinus ostium, so it's now behind the baffle. If he has incorporated the sinus, coronary sinus orifice uh, to the back of the baffle, then all well and good. If you come through the femoral vein, you enter the inferior vena cava orifice, you can put your catheter into the coronary sinus orifice. But if on the other hand, 
the, the coronary sinus orifice has not been incorporated into the systemic venous chamber, then you would have a, a harder time trying to get your catheter through to the coronary sinus orifice. And some, some EP people go try retrograde and some go do a transeptal puncture through the baffle to reach the coronary sinus orifice. And furthermore, the suture line of the baffle, don't forget, the suture line of the baffle crosses your typical flutter isthmus line. These patients who've had previous mustard procedure, many of them will come back in later adulthood with atrial flutter. And you would need to go in and try and ablate the typical flutter line but beware that the baffle is going to be crossing that flutter line, so you need to get to be both sides of that baffle, okay? Then the next um, entity is congenitally corrected transposition, or LTGA which we actually have a heart specimen to show you. But basically, it means that the atrial chambers are connected to the wrong ventricles, plus the wrong great arteries come off the ventricle. So there is double discordant connection, both at atrioventricular level and at ventricular arterial level. There are associated malformations as well, but for your purpose, very important to note that the anterior atrioventricular node and cause of atrioventricular conduction bundle. So in this diagram, I've opened up the right atrium and the, the morphologic left ventricle because the right atrium goes, drains into the morphologic left ventricle sitting on the right side of the heart. This represents the ventricular septal defect and this is a pulmonary valve and pulmonary trunk coming from the left ventricle. So instead of having an atrioventricular node in the triangle of cock making the connection, instead the atrioventricular node is in a totally different position. The important atrioventricular node is the one sitting anteriorly. Atrioventricular conduction bundle goes here, anterior cephalad to the pulmonary valve orifice, yeah? Descends relative to the ventricular septal defect, the other side of the defect, to the anterior cephalad margin of the defect. So a very, very abnormal course of the atrioventricular conduction bundle, you have to remember, in this particular malformation. All right, so very long atrioventricular conduction bundle. Again, right bundle branch, this time going leftward because the morphologic right ventricle is sitting to the left. The left bundle branch descends down the right side of the ventricular septum because your left, your morphologic left ventricle is on the right side. Does that make sense? It's logical, isn't it? Yeah. But because of this very elongated common atrioventricular conduction bundle, these patients, even if they don't have any associated intracardiac defects, yeah, they may survive into the six and seven decades without any issues, but they may present with progressive heart block. That's because this elongated conduction bundle gets progressively more fibrotic. Okay? So these are the patients who may present in your adult clinic much later on. They're, these are the patients who would survive because they haven't got any other intracardiac associated malformations at all. Right? So this is... Still images showing on the right side the atrium anterior connecting node. This is the mitral valve, two goats of cafe muscles, ventricular septal defect behind. This is the cut area, 
through to the palm trunk. This is the continuation of the atrioventricular conduction bundle descending along the anterior cathlet margin of the VSD, right? I'll show you the specimen shortly. And the final malformation is tetralogy of fallow, which is quite a common malformation. But most of these would present in the adult clinic with already repaired uh, procedures, okay? Again, I don't know why. I tried it at home and it worked on my laptop, but it doesn't here. But never mind. The substrate of fallow tetralogy is that you have an overriding of the aortic valve through a ventricular septal defect, and you have muscular subpulmonary obstruction giving you subpulmonary stenosis. The surgeon goes in, may or may not make a ventriculotomy site to enlarge the outflow tract, but certainly needs to excavate the musculature in the outflow tract and certainly needs to close the ventricular septal defect, right? So the first surgical repair back in 1954. So there are, there are a fair number of grown up adults with repaired post-operated uh, fellow cetrology. Conduction system is in the regular location. Again, I don't know why the, the, the movies won't play. And um, Katia Zevenfeld is described in, in, um, in uh, managing these patients for their ventricular um, arrhythmias, uh, various isthmuses, isthmus lines, sort of from, from the epicardial aspect. There's first isthmus between the tricuspid annulus and the, the outflow tract patch. Or second line, maybe between the pulmonary valve attachment and the outflow uh, incision side, or inside the, the right ventricle, another two isthmuses to tackle. And now to the specimens. <coughs> and we we'll switch camera, please. Oh, we are already over time. Goodness me. Can we? Can we get this camera over the specimen? Thank you. Perfect. We're here. We're here. Okay. All right. You see the right atrium? That's good. Just, just zoom in. Zoom in. You don't want to catch my head. My head is not so interesting as a heart. <laughs> The right atrium, you see how dilated the right atrial chamber is. This is the right ventricle. You're looking at the heart from the front. I don't think we need that little picture down at the bottom for now. Yeah. Open up. Okay. Can you see now the fossa ovale? Very nice fossa ovale. Can we see the coronary sinus? Okay, coronary sinus, right? Apex of triangle of cock. So, AV node here. But look at the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. This is all that is left of the septal leaflet. The rest of it hasn't developed. So, actually, there was agenesis of the septal leaflet an agenesis of part of the inferior leaflet. We see the right coronary artery, so we see the fatty tissue plane, uh, fatty tissues here. This is the right atrioventricular group or sulcus. So this is still the atrioventricular junction. So this is atrial myocardium. This is ventricular myocardium. Ventricular myocardium in Epstein may be very thin walled here. So this is termed atrialization of the right ventricle. But it's not going to give you A signals, it's still going to give you B signals because it is ventricular myocardium. You're beneath the atrioventricular junction, okay? So can we see the other side? Just very quickly, this anterior, this anterior superior leaflet, see that? Yeah. This is the anterior annulus already. 
So anterior leaflet is not so affected in terms of uh, the, the, the extent of the leaflet being free up to the annulus, but it's usually inferior leaflet and the septal leaflet that's affected. Okay? That's the next one. Where is the next one? This one. Okay. What is this one? Ah, okay. Nice big heart. If we have the camera more directly over, we won't catch the other hearts, yeah? Thank you. Right atrium, left atrial appendage. Again, whoa, a great big left atrial appendage here. So right atrium, you expect to see the tricuspid valve, don't you? Not sure we're looking at a tricuspid valve. Oh, there's a suture line. So there was a stitching across the atrial septum. There was probably an atrial septal defect. We have a coronary sinus. Yeah. So this, oh, this is little line here. It's the tendon of Todaro. So this is the apex of the triangle of cock, is it? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Coronary sinus orifice. All right. So we expect to find the apex triangle of cock, or we don't, do we? Is it a tretic coronary sinus? I would trust Dr. So to give me a tricky one. Yeah. The coronary sinus orifice is a tretic. I was trying to get my probe through, can't get through. But this is a mitral valve, I think. Can we look in? Indeed, this is a mitral valve. We don't see attachments of the leaflets on the ventricular septum. So that's a clue, yeah? And we confirm that we see the two groups of papillary muscles, typical of a mitral valve, but sitting on the wrong side of the body, yeah? So this is the right-sided ventricle, is the mitral valve. And up there, to this vessel here. This vessel hasn't got coronary orifices. I don't find a coronary orifice. So this is the pulmonary trunk, yeah? So this, already on the right, in the right heart, I'm seeing discordant atrioventricular connections, discordant ventricular arterial connection. What about the other side of the heart? This left atrium. Left atrial appendage. He's tricked me again. He's got a tricuspid valve replacement here. But this is the right ventricle, okay? Coming up to the aorta. Can we see some coronaries? Yes, coronary orifice, yeah? So the aorta coming from the morphologic right ventricle. So we come back to the right side of the heart. We look into the right side of the atrium. We say the triangle of cock is here. We don't, the, an atrioventricular node sitting here will not be making a connection with the atrioventricular conduction bundle. Instead, the atrioventricular node is more here in the anterior margin of the mitral annulus. Okay? And it will pierce through the region of mitral and pulmonary fibrous continuity at this angle. Okay? Pierce through here, come out onto the ventricular myocardium here, right underneath the pulmonary valve. This cut joins up with this cut here. See the pulmonary outflow tract has been opened here? Yeah? Comes so the, the AV bundle sits here, crosses over here, comes down anteriorly in relationship to the, to the, the septum, okay? So anterior course of the atrioventricular connection bundle. Do you want to show them the last one? Oh no, I think, I think we need to run well over time. I'm sorry for that holding up your lunch break. Any questions? Yes. 
in case of the, the, the corrected the transposition of great trans corrected the transposition of great vessel, as you as you mentioned, uh, we can see so the complete AB block not uncommonly. So, but uh, their heart rate is, is not, not not so slow, very fast. So some patients don't need any pacemaker and very tolerable. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so can you can you explain so the why they can have the so the fastest uh, even why they have fast heart rate? I can't explain, but I do know that there are some um, there are the occasional case report of finding of of con corrected transposition of individuals in the ninth decade. Okay, so these patients had absolutely no complaints in life and the pathologist happened to do a post-mortem to find this malformation. So some patients will not have complete, will not even have heart block uh, problems. Yeah. But why they have a fast heart rate? I don't know. You have any idea? I probably have a half fast heart rate too. I don't know. <laughs> Yes. Hello. Yeah. Follow up to this question. Um, I'm presenting tomorrow two reports of CCTJ, uh, a patient of second decade and a patient in his fifth decade, uh, both with advanced AV blocks. My question is, what changes over the decades that makes them present at different times? Is that make them present at different times with AV blocks. Is there any alteration in the NAD? You know, it, it is a thing that, that is a, a mystery, actually, because some, some corrected transpositions are actually born with complete heart block. Yeah, some present in early infancy, and some don't present until much, much later on. The ones I've seen in, that I've done histologic studies on in early infancy, those show like there's no development of part of the conduction bundle, it looks like. Not as if there's some infiltration of fibrous tissue to it. So I think those are the congenital complete heart blocks. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I hope I've, I've stimulated some of you people to become interested in congenital heart malformations because I'm sure with the growing population of adult congenital heart patients, there will be a great need for people to be um, managing them. Okay? Thank you very much for coming. I say goodbye to you because I'm going tomorrow morning. So if you come back tomorrow, I won't be here. I'll leave you in the good hands of my colleagues here. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Gower.